Would you remain standing, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word, and turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and if you don't have a Bible, uh, there is one in the pew in front of you, and I would encourage you to take that pew Bible out and turn to page 1,028, page 1,028 in the pew Bible, Revelation chapter 2. Our text is verses 1 through 7 this morning. Let us hear the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. May God bless the reading and hearing of His Word. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, it was the American philosopher and poet, Bob Dylan, uh, who famously said, the times, they are a-changing. And in some sense, Bob Dylan was right. The 1960s, when he wrote that song, certainly saw a number of changes in our own society and in our world at large. And much like today, it felt like things were changing all too fast. It seemed then, as it often seems now, that the world was just in chaos. So, yes, in one sense, we can say with Dylan, the times, they are a-changing. But a century or so before Bob Dylan, there was a French writer named Jean-Baptiste Carr, who coined a famous phrase that you are probably familiar with as well. It was Carr who said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And of course, there's truth to that statement as well, isn't there? Now, why am I quoting Bob Dylan and Jean-Baptiste Carr? Well, because I think their famous phrases capture something of the way that we ought to think about and read and approach Revelation chapters 2 and 3, these messages to the seven churches in Asia. Because in one sense, much has changed from John's day to our day, from the first century when John is writing to the 21st century in which we live and work and move and have our being. But in another sense, the more things have changed, I think we'd all agree that the more they've stayed the same. So in that sense, it shouldn't surprise us to learn that many of the same problems, many of the same struggles, many of the same temptations that these seven churches faced are some of the exact same problems and struggles 
and temptations that we still face in the church today. Now, sure, they, they may be dressed up in different clothes. They may have modern lingo that they use, but the same problems still plague us today in the 21st century that plagued these churches back in the first century. And we can see that very clearly here in the message that was given to the first of these seven churches, the church at Ephesus. Because what we see in these verses is that this church, the church in Ephesus, was commended by Jesus for their doctrinal discernment. But this church is criticized by Jesus for its lack of love. This is a church that is doctrinally sound. It is theologically orthodox. It is standing for the truth. It's just cold and rigid and hard-hearted. It's imbalanced. And brothers and sisters, we may be thousands of years from this church, and we may be thousands of miles away from ancient Ephesus, But I think we would agree that this same imbalance is still an issue for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today. So we need to hear what it is that Jesus says to us in these verses. Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to his churches. So let us have an ear. Let us hear what it is Jesus says to us because we don't want to be guilty of a discernment that is devoid of love. We want to be committed to both truth and love. Not one or the other, but the same. We we want to be committed to conviction and compassion, doctrine and devotion. We want to love God with all our minds, yes, and we want to love God with all our hearts, all our soul, all our strength. So as we look at these verses this morning and we hear what Jesus says, says to the church in Ephesus, I want us to hear what he says to us. And I want us to hear just one primary truth from this passage. I just want to have one main point that I want you to consider from this text, and here it is. Doctrinal discernment is good and necessary, but it's not enough. Doctrinal discernment is good and necessary, but it's not enough. We should be doctrinally discerning. That's a good thing. It is a necessary thing. And Jesus praises this church for their doctrinal and theological discernment. They are doing, as we read together just a little while ago from 2 Timothy, they're seeking to rightly handle the word of truth. They're seeking to stand for the truth, and Jesus commends them for that. It's just that that is not enough. That discernment can't be lacking in love, and that was the problem for the church in Ephesus. So I want us to listen to what Jesus says to this church, and I want us to listen to what Jesus may be saying to us as a church and to us individually this morning. So look first at how Jesus establishes his authority to speak to this church and and to any of the other churches and his authority to speak to us. Look at what Jesus reminds them of before he says anything about them. Look at what he says in chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, remember what we saw last week. If you were with us last Sunday as we looked at Revelation chapter 1, where we saw in that opening vision that John describes for us, we saw Jesus, the risen and exalted and glorious Son of Man, reigning with all majesty and all power and all dominion and all authority. But remember, where did John see Jesus standing, reigning with all this glory and with all this power? 
he saw him in the presence of his churches, in the presence of his people. He saw Jesus in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, which were symbolic of these seven churches. And remember, we saw Jesus holding the seven stars in his right hand. So Jesus walks among the lampstands, meaning he is present among his people. He is present among his church. And because he is present among them, he knows their strength. And he knows their weaknesses. He knows where they are standing strong and where they are falling away. That's why he is able to address each church individually and speak to its specific strengths or weaknesses. And he says he holds them in his right He holds his churches, meaning he has authority over them. They belong to him. So he has both the authority and the ability to speak these messages to these, his churches, his people. And so the first church he addresses, we're told there in verse 1, is the church in Ephesus. He tells John to write this first message to the church in Ephesus. Now, the church in the ancient city of Ephesus Ephesus was a significant church because it resided in a significant city. The city of Ephesus had significance. It had political significance. It was one of the major cities in the Roman province of Asia. It had commercial and economic significance because Three great trade routes all converged. They all came together right there in the city of Ephesus. And, of course, it had religious significance, not only for the church but for others, for pagans, because it was in Ephesus that the temple to the mythological goddess Artemis was housed. This is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, this temple to Artemis. So Ephesus was a place where Uh, People knew and people came. And so this was a place that was not only known for the exchange of goods and money, but this was also a place that was known for the exchange of ideas. Religious talk was always going on in a place like Ephesus. It was a strategic city, which is no surprise to us then to remember that this is where Paul, the Apostle Paul, set up home base for his ministry throughout Asia. You may remember Paul set up Ephesus as his home, as his base for three years as he ministered in and around Asia. Paul was the one who founded this church in Ephesus on his second missionary journey. And then on his third missionary journey, as he comes back through Ephesus, he decides to stay there and he spends three years in and around Asia. Ephesus, laboring there. Later, he sends Timothy, his young protege, to Ephesus to serve amongst those people in that church. Paul even wrote a letter to this church that we have in the New Testament, the letter we call Ephesians. And then we know from history that later, sometime later after Paul, after Timothy, that the apostle John, same author of this book, Revelation, John went and lived and served among this church. So this church, the church in Ephesus, was probably the most prominent of the seven churches that Jesus tells John to write to because of its location and because of its history. But because of its location, remember what I just said about the kind of city that Ephesus was Because of where it was located, this was a church that was susceptible to all kinds of false teaching. Because all kinds of people were constantly coming and going in Ephesus, and there were constantly false teachers coming to town, trying to get the church, trying to get Christians to buy whatever it is they were selling, whatever religious uh, 
thing that they were trying to promote, whatever uh, aberrant lifestyle they were trying to encourage them to adopt and begin to live by. So there were constantly these false teachers that were coming in and were uh, espousing different views, different philosophies, different teaching. And so it's no wonder that we hear Paul who labored to establish this church and then spent three years strengthening and building up this church and then sent Timothy to serve in this church. It's no wonder that we hear Paul warning this church about false teaching. Remember, in uh, Paul's tearful farewell, when he left this church in Acts chapter 20, you may remember the scene that Luke describes for us in Acts chapter 20 as Paul is getting ready to leave after spending three years here. Uh, Luke describes it as kind of a tearful goodbye that Paul has with the Ephesian elders, the leaders of this church. But what does he say to them before he departs? He warns them to be on their guard. He warns them to be discerning. He says, listen, be careful because there will be those that arise from within you, from within this church From your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things, false things, to try to draw away the disciples after them. So he's warning them. There are going to be those who are going to try to lead you astray from the truth. So be on guard. Be discerning. When he writes to Timothy while he was serving in Ephesus, he warns Timothy saying, listen, I want you to instruct certain men, certain men in the Ephesian church, I want you to instruct them not to teach strange doctrines, not to teach things that are false and that are strange. In other words, be on your guard. So this is a church that has been warned from the beginning of their existence, to be cautious, to be discerning, to be steadfast in standing for the truth. And it appears that such warnings have been heard by them. They've been heeded by them because now, some 40 years later, so when Jesus is writing this or telling John to write this to the church in Ephesus, we're about 40 years after the founding of this church by the Apostle Paul. Now, some 40 years later, what do we hear? We hear Jesus praising this church for doing exactly what Paul encouraged them to do, to stand fast for the truth, to be discerning. Listen to verses 2 and 3. Jesus says, I know your works. I know your toil, I know your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Doctrinal discernment is good, and it's necessary. That's why Jesus commends them for it. He says, listen, I know your works in this regard. I know your toil, your labors. I've seen them firsthand. I know how you have patiently endured against false teaching. You can't bear with those who are evil. You don't tolerate them, and you are able to see through those false teachers. You're able to spot a spiritual phony. You're able to recognize a religious charlatan when you see one because you've tested them. You've tested those who call themselves apostles but really aren't, and you have found them to be false. You have tested them and recognized them for what they are. You have exercised doctrinal discernment, and thus you have prevented this church from being ruined by false teaching. And there were numerous churches that had been ruined by false doctrine, and they have stood firm. They have been firm, and they've been even intolerant when intolerance was called for. And Jesus says, I know you've been consistent in this. You've not grown weary 
in this. You've not given up in this fight, but you have held firm. You have stood faithfully for my name and for the sake of my truth. Jesus praises them for being doctrinally and spiritually discerning. This is a good thing. Oh, that more Christians and more churches would be discerning. That we wouldn't accept anything and everything just because it claims to be Christian. That we wouldn't be deceived by false teaching and by those who call themselves apostles or call themselves pastors or call themselves preachers, but who really aren't. That we would test them just as this church does, and find them to be false. Brothers and sisters, I know you've heard me say this before, but I think it bears repeating in a text like this. Just because something is sold in a Christian bookstore does not mean you should read it. And just because something is on Christian TV doesn't mean that you ought to watch it. And just because someone has a bunch of hits on YouTube doesn't mean they deserve your time and attention. And just because someone claims to have special knowledge from God does not mean that they actually do. Be discerning. Test what you read and what you hear against the Scriptures. Doctrinal discernment is good and necessary for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus isn't condemning this church for being spiritually discerning. He is praising this church for being spiritually discerning. In fact, even though he's going to call them out in a moment for their lack of love, notice that Jesus actually praises this church for hating something that he himself hates. Look down at verse 6. Jesus says, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, we don't know a lot about the Nicolaitans. We we don't really know who they were or exactly what they taught. We know they're mentioned again in the message that Jesus has to the church in Pergamum. But it seems that this was a group of false teachers, uh, some sort of heretical sect that uh, was trying to encourage different forms of immorality and idolatry. So they were trying to deceive the people of God and lead them into uh, certain forms of immorality and idolatry. And the Ephesian church is having none of it. I mean, they were calling these Nicolaitans out on their false teaching. They were not giving them a foothold in their church. They saw through their lies and they stood firm against them and Jesus praises them for it. He praises them for hating the things that he hates, deception and immorality and idolatry. So listen, there there is a place for us in the church to stand and to stand firmly and to stand resolutely for the truth to call out false teaching, to draw lines and say, this is in bounds, this is out of bounds, this is acceptable, this is sinful. And the world, listen, the world may respond to that as, as viewing us as intolerant or bigoted. They may shame us. They may even bring lawsuits against us. But Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, will commend us for standing for the truth. Jesus praises such doctrinal and moral and spiritual discernment. But as quick as we are to amen that kind of praise for standing for the truth, brothers and sisters, let's remember that that's not all Jesus says to this church. There is more to this text. There is much for Jesus to commend in this church. But let's not forget, Jesus has a criticism for this church as well. He has a rebuke for this church. So yes, 
doctrinal discernment is good and necessary, but it's not enough. It's not enough. By itself, it is deficient. It must be accompanied by love. It must be accompanied by love. Love can't be lacking. Because listen to what Jesus says in verse 4. But I have this against you. He praises them for all these ways in which they're holding fast and being discerning. But now he says, I've got something against you. I have this against you, verse 4, that you have abandoned turned your back on, walked away from the love that you had at first. This love that the Ephesians have abandoned is probably both a love for Christ and a love for one another. I think both of them are in view here. Because this church has been so focused on fighting against false teaching, doing battle for the truth, because they've been so focused on testing everything and everyone to ensure that it's sound and that it's true, there has now arisen within this congregation, at least apparently so, there has risen this general sense of suspicion. They're suspicious of one another and others because they've had to be so careful and so guarded and so cautious and because they're surrounded by enemies trying to deceive them, trying to lead them astray, they have gradually turned inward and they have hardened themselves and become self-protective. And this still happens today, does it not? I mean, Does this not describe 21st century churches, not just a 1st century church? We can be so focused on doctrinal purity and we can put all of our energy into ensuring theological accuracy or moral standards that we can grow cold and rigid and we can have very little love for one another or for outsiders. We can be so zealous for the truth But our zeal can be harsh and unloving. And that's a problem. And Jesus says it's a problem. In fact, Jesus says he has this against his church. He has this against them. He calls them out. He rebukes them for their lack of love. He praises them for their discernment. But he condemns them rebukes them for abandoning the love that they once had. That love and devotion to Him, not just a love for being right all the time. Their love and compassion and care for those within the body, not just about proving themselves right against those outside. And brothers and sisters, this is a rebuke that we need to hear because this problem still exists today. And things like cable news and the internet and social media have only enhanced this problem. Things like Facebook and Twitter and blogs and comment sections and cable news talk shows have fostered within us a critical spirit, and they have made it all too easy to exercise doctrinal discernment while completely abandoning the love of Jesus Christ and love for neighbor. They've fostered this critical spirit within us where we are quick to point out and criticize every doctrinal or theological or moral fault, but we are slow to show love and concern and compassion for a brother or sister who bears the name of Jesus Christ. We can get so caught up in being doctrinal police 
And we can get so caught up in striving for theological accuracy that we can completely lose sight of what it is we're, we're standing for. We can get so caught up that it's no longer about being discerning. It's only about being right. It is just that we are spoiling for a fight. We are just looking for someone to argue with. And we can develop an unhealthy craving for controversy. And brothers and sisters, there is nothing commendable about that. Nothing. That is what Jesus is criticizing and rebuking. So doctrinal discernment, hear me, it's good, it's necessary, it's just not enough. It must be accompanied by love, a sincere love for the Lord and a sincere love for others. Now listen, there are going to be things that we need to be against and we need to stand against and we ought to be known for being against those things doctrinally and morally. But there are also things that we ought to be known that we are for, not just against. We ought to be known that we are for Christ. We are for His kingdom. We are for one another. We are for loving our neighbor. We ought to be known by our love. In fact, Jesus says, this is how the world ought to know us. They will know that we are His disciples by our love for one another, not by how we criticize each other in the comments thread online. So we can't become so critical in our discernment that we abandon love. And let's be honest, that is the temptation that we all too often face. And that's the trap that we all too often fall into. So look at what Jesus says we ought to do there in The first part of verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Jesus says that if we've fallen into this trap of being discerning without being loving, if we've become so critical of others that we've lost our love for them, then Jesus says we ought to do three things. Remember, repent, and return. Remember, repent, and return. First, he says, remember. Remember from where you've fallen. Remember, reflect. Go back in your mind, in your heart, to what it used to be like when you were filled with love for the Lord and for His people. Remember what it was like when your heart was filled with care and concern and compassion for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And remember what it was like when your heart burned with love and devotion for the Lord Jesus Christ. When you were not so concerned about being right all the time. When you were not so harsh and unloving, but when you just loved others and the Lord with an obvious devotion to Him and to His church. Second, Jesus says repent. Repent. Make a change. Stop being so critical. If that means you need to stop spending so much time online, then stop spending so much time online. If that means you need to stop watching so much cable news, stop watching so much cable news. Do whatever you have to do to free yourself from the influences of such a critical spirit where you are only demeaning others and looking for ways to fight and battle against others and win arguments rather than seeking to win the love and respect of your brothers and sisters. So acknowledge that you've been unloving, that you've been caught up in this sort of spirit of the age, and you're just as unloving as the world. Acknowledge that and then repent And then third, return. Return to the loving works that once marked your earlier Christian life. Stop spending all your time criticizing people and start spending some time serving other people. Stop looking for ways to find fault with everybody and start finding ways to love and serve other people. Find ways that you can serve people in your life group. 
that you can love them. If they've got needs, find ways. Spend your time on something that is valuable, something that is giving life and helping and serving others. Return to the works that once marked your Christian life. Do the works you did at first. And brothers and sisters, notice how serious Jesus takes this lack of love. Notice why I said being doctrinally discerning is good and necessary, but it's not enough. Because look at the warning that Jesus issues there at the end of verse 5, if you refuse to repent. Look at the last part of verse 5. If not, if you will not remember and repent and do the works you did at first, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Jesus says, if you don't repent, you will cease to be a church. He will remove their lampstand. They will no longer exist and function as a church. That's how serious Jesus takes this need for love. So brothers and sisters, that means we can have all our doctrine right and we can be on the right side of every moral issue of our day, but if we abandon love, we will destroy this church. Let me say that again. We can be right about every doctrinal issue, and we can be right about every moral issue, but according to what Jesus says here, if we abandon love, we will cease to function and exist as a church of His. So let's strive, let's strive as a church to be known for discernment and love. Not one or the other, but both simultaneously. Let's stand firm in our convictions, but let's be loving and compassionate. Let's be right-headed and let's be warm-hearted. Because doctrinal discernment is good and necessary, but it's not enough. So listen, if you've fallen into this trap of becoming overly suspicious and overly critical and you've begun to neglect love, then do as Jesus says to do here. Remember, repent, and return. And hear the warning that He sounds if you don't. But then also hear the promise that he provides if we do. Listen to what he says in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If we will hold fast and Keep standing for the truth and keep loving God and loving others. Jesus promises us eternal life. He promises us eternal salvation. He offers us the privilege that was taken from, that was removed from Adam and Eve when they were exiled from the Garden of Eden. He offers us the privilege to eat of the tree of life. And so this morning as we eat from the Lord's table... We're going to do so both in remembrance and in anticipation. We're going to eat in remembrance of what Christ has done for us, how He was nailed to the tree, how He was crucified for us, how He has redeemed us from our sins, how He has borne the curse brought on by Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, and how by His death and by His resurrection, He has now opened the way back for us to be reconciled to God and ushered back in to paradise. And we're going to eat in anticipation of the day when we shall eat of the tree of life there in paradise. When we are in the presence of the Lord we love and who so deeply loves us, His bride. So let us celebrate this morning. Let us celebrate His love for us and our love for Him as we eat and drink at His table. And friend, if you don't know the love of Jesus Christ, then we who do, we want you to know this. It's a simple truth, but 
It is something that has made all the difference for us. We love Him because He first loved us. We love Him not because we've got it all together and because we figured it all out. No, 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 no. We are just as much a mess as you are, if not more so. But we love Him because we have come to know and believe that He first loved us. And He demonstrated His love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were still His enemies, while we were still rebelling and running away from Him, Jesus Christ died for us. He gave His body to be broken for us. He shed His blood for us so that we might be forgiven, so that we may be made right with God, so that we might be redeemed and brought back into the fold, back into the family, and given a place at His table, and given the promise that we will be with Him in paradise where we can eat of the tree of life. And friends, we want you to know that He still holds out that offer of love and salvation to you today. So won't you receive it? Won't you receive the gift that He is giving to you? The gift of Himself, the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life? He still offers this promise to you. To the one who conquers, that is, the one who trusts in Him and holds fast to Him and loves Him and His people. He promises the gift of salvation and eternal life to eat of the tree of life in paradise. Won't you receive that gift today? And for those of us who already have, let's thank Him for that promise. And let's eat and drink today at His table in anticipation of the day and we will eat of the tree of life with Him in paradise. Let's pray together. And as we sit in silence, would you take a moment to reflect on what Jesus has said to you through His Word this morning? And would you prepare your hearts to receive this meal with gratitude and with joy for the love of your Savior? Jesus Christ. Well, God, we confess that many of us come to this, your table this morning, full of sin and lacking in love. Lord, we confess that like the Ephesians, we have become critical and suspicious and harsh and cold and unloving. But Lord, we repent of that kind of lack of love this morning. And we ask that You would wash us in Your love. Would You remind us of Your great love for us seen here at the table? And would it cause us to be so filled with love that we then reach out in love to others? Might it change the way we think and react to others? And Lord, might we celebrate your love for us in giving your body, shedding your blood when we were undeserving and unworthy. So Lord, receive us as unworthy and undeserving as we are. Thank you that you have made us your own in Christ and you welcome us to your table today. So may we eat in joy and gratitude now. In Jesus' name we pray.